producers are the creators of history and the future. And when you just look back in time, who is it that always stands out? It's the people that always create, right? It is the people that have actually taken the time to do something big with their lives and not just sit around and consume. I like this saying, and the way it goes is really just, you can either be playing the game or watching the game. If you're watching the game, mostly what you're doing is just looking on the sidelines, by the fences, and just kind of just passively observing everything going on. And it's almost as if you're just living a passive life, almost like a NPC kind of, right? But the thing is, why does this happen? And there could be a host of different reasons and causes why we are this way. Well, first thing is that technology with the advent and technology could be anything. It could be mental frameworks. It could be actual digital devices. It could be tools that can enhance productivity, getting more output, poor unit of input in. Now, what I mean is as humans evolve, history changes and societies become more advanced. What happens is that technology becomes more better. And with this, you basically get more options. Now think about this. When you reflect back to a village or some sort of archaic town, some sort of civilization where it's basically just mostly agricultural. These people are just farming. They're maintaining their households. The men are usually going out and providing for the family, whereas the women are maybe just tending the home with the kids. Now, with the limited scope of technology available at that time, what do you think these people are doing on a daily basis? Probably not much other than what we can imagine and hypothesize that these people are doing back then, right? Just the basic necessities, maintaining the household, getting food on the table, and that's about it. But now with technology, what happens is that you have more variety there's more selection, there's more different mediums you can consume. And what happens as a result is that it can become really overwhelming, overwhelming to a point where it really just paralyzes you. And when that happens, well, you're not creating, you're not really producing some sort of maybe even useful output that you find meaningful. And as a result, you're just kind of passively observing and watching everything happening right before your eyes without actually having some sort of integral part that actually gives you some sort of joy. So in short, technology, what it really does is just provides people more options, more selection, whether it's through media, it's through some sort of code, it's through some sort of new tools, it's some sort of new opportunity vehicles that are presented. Now with AI and everything, look how many opportunities have suddenly arose, right? Look how many problems have also been solved. But at the same time, look at all the dangers people are potentially facing, right? Of what's to come, the prediction. It's opening up a, a huge Pandora's box of different concerns, different potential value we can bring. And it's just becoming more and more exponential. So when all of this is happening, right? And even let's just like sidetrack you to social media real quick. There's like, what, 95 million photos and videos being posted on Instagram daily, 600 million tweets per day on X and about what, like 700,000 of video hours being produced every single day on YouTube. That's pretty overwhelming. And then it becomes very, very important to basically take some time and assess what it is, what is important for you to consume every single day on these platforms. And even if it's necessary at all, because if you just spend the majority of your time daily, weekly, monthly, just consuming, nothing's going to happen, right? Especially too, if you're trying to get out of a situation, you're trying to upgrade your life, you're trying to become more productive. What happens is that you just become a consumer and as your life just goes by, nothing really becomes like fruitful from it, right? There's no sort of like real fruit you can be proud of. And by this, I mean, obviously, some sort of output, some sort of work, some sort of 
creation that is purely yours, right? That you could be proud of. And the more we consume, it basically creates this sort of mental clutter or also known as cognitive overload. There's all these different things we're keeping in mind and the more selection, more options, more variety there is to assess and analyze and contemplate on. What happens is that the mental load, the cognitive load that is a result from all of this, it delays your decision making, especially too, if you don't have proper frameworks, mental models, or some sort of processes where you can quickly analyze and assess decisions to make the next decision. Now think of it this way also, like if you're accumulating a bunch of stuff, objects, clothes, or just possessions, it takes a lot of mental bandwidth just to worry about it because, oh, now you have to worry about this car's insurance. You have to worry about that car's flat tire. You have to worry about that car's maintenance. You have to worry about cleaning every single empty five room living space you have in your house because you live in this massive house. You have to also get like a cleaning person to clean up the mess that you don't really do yourself. And now there's just all this mental load occupying your mind. So same thing goes for all this information, right? You could have all these different information. It's all just occupying your mind there. And when, when you just don't at some point, just shut it off and just let some of it process, right? The, you need like a fine balance between how much input you're getting and then how much output you're producing as a result from it. But if it's just too much input and you're not giving enough time to process it, maybe synthesize some sort of thoughts or create some sort of new creation from what you've just consumed. Well, you're just going to be stuck in this sort of paralysis by analysis of this overwhelming information and you're just kind of stuck there. So what I want you to think about now is flipping a switch in your mind and not being more of a consumer, right? Just, just to consume, but being more so of a conscious consumer. And by this, I mean having a sort of healthy information diet, removing distractions, right? The apps, the, the YouTube, the maybe eating, inputting some, or just enabling some sort of time blockers, whether it's on your computer, your, there's Chrome extensions. There are even tactics you can use on your phone to make it less appealing to even use in the first place, like setting it by setting the the screen display to like black and white, right? That's scientifically proven to help reduce phone use, right? Even consumption, even increasing the friction before you consume more, such as putting your phone in another room while you're working, or maybe just putting it on the opposite side of where you're working, or maybe even turning it completely off because now you have to wait, you, you can just like pick it up and look at the notifications or what's going on. You're just adding this friction to make it harder. And there's apps to that, like add like another layer or like a point of contact you have to make before you actually use your phone, right? I think there's one like called like Clarity or something like that, I don't know. But there's these different ways where you can just start being more mindful in terms of how you're consuming diet or just like, excuse me, information and then it helping you prevent becoming so overwhelmed and just par excuse me, paralyzed by all this overload of information and everything, right? Cutting down hours, spending less time on that and actually devoting more of that time into actually creating. And the thing is that we don't necessarily need more information. Information is very important because without information, we may just not have the context or the wisdom, I guess you can say, to know what to do, right? Because when we have this knowledge, when we have this information, we, actually, we can actually do something with it because whether it's from someone's past experience, whether it's from some sort of expert, whether it's just someone giving good advice, at least you have some sort of mental map you can use or follow or just some sort of like nuggets to take and just test for yourself. But when there's just too much of it and it's like also to having multiple mentors. When you have too many mentors, you just don't, at some point, don't know who to follow. But when you're just specializing more around one or two or like a handful of people, you can kind of like maybe grasp a pattern from them or get like a good amount of insights from maybe one or two of them and then just stick with those, right? Because then it can just help you with your decision making. But when we just have too much information, it paralyzes it all. So it's not that we need more information. It's just that we need more implementation and with that have some sort of fine balance with what we're getting into our brain because we still need information of some sort 
to just stay up to trend, right? Especially if you're like in very competitive fields like technology or whatever it may be. Or two, if you just wanna be at like the top one, one percentile of whatever domain of mastery you have in your life, right? And that's really the way to go about it because you actually need to consume and learn constantly to evolve as a human and also just to have that sort of social capital and career capital so you can always just be on the edge, be one of the very best or at least the top 3%. So you do need the input. But what I'm really trying to stress is having the right balance or even a disproportionate balance of output and the implementation with what you're doing with what you're learning, right? So there's the input. And then there's some sort of way we have to have to process this input, right? Whether it's using Notion databases, Obsidian databases, even journaling, even being able to have like this thing I call insight time where you just step away from your work and you just go on a walk and then you just let your thoughts process, not even consuming a podcast or anything because then you're still just consuming and you're just walking. But when you have this sort of insight time and then you just kind of allow yourself to reflect and introspect on everything you're just, you've just been learning, what this enables is you to figure out what's the next decision to do right from here. Because you do need like this sort of space before, like between the input and the output. Because if you just get the input and you just go straight to output without any sort of like processing, well, it could turn out that you just go into too much output and then a year goes by and you realize, damn, I was just working on the wrong stuff. So rather than making a the mistake there, there's always it's always good to have this sort of like middle ground where you can like process it somehow and then just kind of like predict the different futures, the different avenues this can potentially go and then see what you can create from that, right? And then of course, once that is done, what you want to do next is actually do the output, right? After you've processed it, maybe do some sort of mental frameworks or even asking other people, or even just kind of like thinking it through, right? Making sure you're about to make the right decision. Now, what you want to do is actually increase as much output as you potentially can. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to work 20 hours a day, right? Because there's some people who only work like an hour a day, a couple hours a day. Hell, what's his name? Warren Buffett. This guy literally just reads the majority of his day, right? But his output is extremely powerful and he gets paid purely based on judgment. And he makes multi-million, multi-billion dollar deals with whatever investments he chooses to invest into and so on. And it's really because he has that much leverage at that position he is in life, right? So it's not necessarily just about doing a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of different types of output, right? But more so rather knowing what kind of output to optimize for and then also having some sort of fine balance of like input to guide your output. So... What I'm really saying is like, when we're getting this implementation in, then what I'm really trying to say is find the most optimal ways to maximize your productivity. So every one unit of input or like every minute you spend hearing something, learning something, or you just time, whatever unit of time you wanna use for like learning, the output is disproportionate in its value. So every time you consume, let's say one YouTube video, the output of like whether you create another YouTube video or you create a product off of it or you do something with it as a disproportionate ratio of output meaning yeah you're leveraging your time and even though you may be a lazy person at the end of the day the output assuming it has leverage right with like something posting on social media or sharing with other people online or maybe even creating some sort of digital product right or even like consulting too or doing something like that you're getting a disproportionate ratio of alpha for each unit of time spent and the thing too is that we live in like this sort of culture where hustle culture is really promoted on all fronts they have to work a lot you have to work a lot especially too with some big social media fig- figures telling you that you have to work a lot and i'm all for work yes it makes you feel good gives you purpose especially too if you're like you're self-employed you're doing your own thing then there's a lot of value in doing work But it's also very important to consider what you're working on and if that work, whatever you're doing, has any sort of leverage, right? Take into consideration this, especially if you want to test it out for increasing or excuse me, increasing your output with your work. And it would be by implementing into it Parkinson's law and 80-20. And what I mean by this, especially too, if you're finding yourself overworking, you're finding other facets of your life diminishing in quality relationships, 
love, maybe just personal happiness because work just entirely consumes you. So rather than working eight, 10 hours a day, what I challenge you to do is cut that in half to five hours a day. Now, this might seem scary and be like, yo, I, I can't do this right now because I just have all these obligations. I have all these things I have to do. I have all these tasks. Like I have all, all these giant lists of things. And what's critical to understand is, are you doing work just so you can be busy? Or are you doing work that actually moves everything forward? And what I want you to understand is that when we cut the workload in half, or just like even the time spent, like from 10 hours a day to five hours a day, you're forcing yourself to find the most important activities every single day. And with that, every single day, you are forced to basically have like a handful of activities to work with and a certain amount of time to allocate into those activities, right? And the whole point of this is just so you can do more things in your life that you actually enjoy. So you're not just a robot, you're actually a human. And on top, when you do work, you're fully recharged. You're fully recharged. You can go creative. You can go hard. You can do whatever it is that you want. And by ensuring the tasks you work on on a daily basis are actually high output, you're always just working on the most essential thing. Always on an essential thing. Because if it is not essential, like think about it. If you want to be a YouTuber or whatever it is that you want to be, what is the most single essential thing they have to do you have to create videos right even if you suck you know i'm still learning this is still very new to me but hey i want to share what i learned so what's the most essential thing to do it's literally creating videos what else is essential potentially having a script right being able to crystallize your thoughts what else is essential having some sort of idea something that people may potentially be interested in watching right these are all essentials but Whereas like, let's say you also want to be a YouTuber, but at the same time you have all these other things, you're working on all these different business models, all, all these different things. Like, is that really essential? If your number one goal is to build a channel just so it can offer you time freedom, or maybe it's just to monetize some sort of, I don't know, skill you have or something like that. And you're doing all these other things that are not essential to like the main goal, then everything else just has to be aggressively cut out of your life because it's just a waste of time and there's this philosophy it's called essentialism i believe there's this prominent book that was released by an author not that long ago i actually haven't read it but i listened to a few podcasts and like some videos on it and it's called essentialism but basically essentialism as a philosophy basically de derives its name from the word essence meaning the essence of a thing so if the essence of water is h2o that means the essence of let's say YouTube, for example, just means really producing good quality video content, right? That is just the essence of it. And everything else is not necessary. Nothing else is not necessary that enables you to produce high quality content. And the same thing applies when choosing what to work on. What is essential? What is the one thing I can work on? What are maybe like the handful of things I can work on on a daily basis, week, month, whatever. It's just deriving the essence of what that thing is and then structuring a daily habit ritual set of tasks routines whatever that moves everything forward and in, in purpose or just in pursuit of that goal nothing else matters right so hustle culture can really kill you but when you shift your mindset to yeah you're going to be a producer now but at the same time you're going to be a conscious producer and by this, you can be a highly leveraged producer by finding the right things to work on just so your other areas can be fixed and straight and straightened out. Because if you don't have those areas straightened out, well, what happens? You just become miserable, right? You just become miserable and there's really no, no sort of zest to life itself. You're just this working machine without friends, without love, without being able to explore, actually see life, maybe visit a few places, maybe even just to like have some sort of new experiences for the first time in your life because you've just been indoctrinated with this hustle culture. There's so much technology, so much opportunity, all these different possibilities and things you can do right now just to be highly leveraged, right? But it's really about changing the beliefs and what's inside of here 
and then being able to see through like these new lens, new perspectives, new paradigms, so you can go out there and break yourself out of this trap you're in, right? That's maybe even causing you burnout, causing you problems, just causing this mental anxiety, decreasing your health. So you can create this sort of lifestyle and this sort of just life where you're not just passively living and you're also just not aggressively working just to work, but you're consciously creating a life where the input to output ratio is just right. It's just right. And that can sound very vague, but as I, again, what I mean by just right is you're consuming the right input or right amount of input, and then you have significant leverage in whatever you do to produce that output. And a final note I want to leave everyone off on is this. We touched a little bit earlier, but it's really just removing the unnecessary in your life. You don't need all these other things. You don't need all these other possessions. You don't need all these different business models, all these different things, especially if you have nothing. In the beginning, when you have nothing, it is very important to just focus on the key one, two, three things that move everything in forward, especially too if you have almost no time to do things because work, school, whatever it may be, obligations, family, it could be anything. It's removing all of this unnecessary things, selling it, getting rid of it, giving it away, and then focusing on the core essential few things that matter. And that is just the essence of what you're striving for, the goal, the main thing. So with that, that'll be all. That'll be for the video. I hope this video was insightful. If you enjoyed it, I'd appreciate a like, comment, subscribe. Let me know what you thought of it. And looking forward to see you all in the next one. Peace.